Well, I guess we'll get uh, started. All right. We got uh, Mario, <laughs> the diehard fan. <laughs> I like so, I mean, I need to practice my presentation either way. So we'll, uh, we'll give it a shot and hopefully it doesn't blow up in our face. Uh, but today is going to be a, about product improvements. We have a demo of uh, using a Kidna, first of all. I feel like we never did that. So let's set up that. And then we're going to talk about recipes. Then we're going to get started with uh, using recipes for recurring jobs. And then I'm going to talk about some of the longer term uh, goals with uh, Recon and some ideas for um, things that are going to happen uh, because I'm actually going to kind of tell a story about what happened in the past and uh, why we're building something at Recon that I think is going to have a big impact. So I'm going to share my screen. Please, Mario, let me know when you see it. Still loading? Oh, I can see it. Awesome. So the first thing is that if you have access to staging, you should see a few new links. Uh, initially, Recon allowed to build repos. It also allows to run jobs. And uh, something we found is that it's actually really tedious to set up all of these uh, boxes. And so we've introduced recipes, which uh, are basically this button right here that effectively allow to automatically fill in all of the details for a job so that all of the tedium goes away. You need to set them once. Obviously for Recon Pro, we can set them for you as customers and then that way you're gonna be able to reuse them. Uh, recipes also unlock the ability of using forbidden operations. So in this case, we have a mainnet fuzzing recipe. And so due to security concerns, uh, we cannot allow people to set this up on the UI because it's a security risk. However, because recipes can be created by administrator uh, accounts, we can actually set up this arbitrary command. And so we can actually execute anything. We can have dynamic replacement, Anvil, we can do Forknet. So all of this stuff is unlocked uh, by recipes. And so I thought it would be good to show a couple of things. First of all, uh, we never showed how to build an Echidna project. So uh, the, the simplest way will be to grab any um, contract and then we will simply download a repo in the usual way. And I'm going to just grab a random uh, folder that I already set up called TWAP study. Uh, but what I want to show is that uh, if you download the recon folder, you're going to get the echidna.yaml file. And uh, for uh, most people, uh, they may actually have troubles in running echidna simply because just like Medusa, Medusa uh, has this foundry compile all extra arguments right here, uh, which effectively specifies that you can, uh, that you're supposed to also uh, build the test folder. Um, and so we actually have to do the same thing for Echidna. If you Google it, you eventually find it. But what you will actually find is that all you have to change is you need to add this line called critic args dash dash foundry compile all. And if you do, then you actually unlock the ability of using Echidna. So I'm going to demonstrate that by using a setup they already written. We've uh, done multiple demos of this repo. It's called TWAP study. It's on my GitHub. And I have the classic test recon folder set up. I've put both echidna.yaml and medusa.json outside of the test folder. And what you'll see is that if you click on the critic tester, the command is echidna dot dash dash contract critic tester dash dash config echidna.yaml. So what I have here is I'm on a um, Docker image that is already in this repo because I use echidna through Docker just for convenience. And so if I run the command, you'll see that it will work and uh, uh, it will work in two stages. The first stage is it will compile and then it's going to be able to run slither on all of the files. Whereas what's going to happen if I delete 
the extra line down here is that either the compilation or slither will fail. And so I'm just gonna demonstrate that real quick. You'll see that um, it's just gonna fail basically. It's not gonna find it. And so something some people try to do will be to move the critic tester on SRC. And uh, that sometimes works, other times it doesn't. And so in this case, I'm just gonna change it to test recon and I'm gonna give it a shot. Uh, but it, it typically has uh, um, sketchy results where uh, that's, some, that's something very common that I've seen is that you end up compiling the system, but then you end up getting an error with slither that is unable to run. And so uh, our advice is simply to instead keep everything in the test folder and then have the extra line right here for critics args. So that way you should have an easy time uh, compiling the uh, repos. And so what we will do for running a kid on the cloud for uh, Recon Pro is first of all, we will need to have access to the repo. So I'm gonna grab it. And then I will click on the Echidna option and you can see that the second I click on this, I get different options here on the right. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, this is gonna look really similar to when you use Medusa. Whereas here on the right, we have to add a few more parameters that map out to the commands that we're running here. So in this case, we're saying that we need to compile everything. We need to get the contract called Critic Tester. So I'm just gonna grab the contract name, Critic Tester and then the config is gonna be called echidna.yaml. And then uh, if I wanted to specify a test limit, uh, then I would uh, uh, specify it here. Otherwise it's gonna to default to something like either 10,000 or 50,000 runs. Uh, after our latest upgrade, uh, we very comfortably support over 100,000 runs uh, within minutes. So we suggest running uh, uh, a lot higher uh, runs. But what's gonna happen here is that I can run the job, uh, but now all of these commands, I'm gonna have to type them every time. And so with recipes instead, we can go here and we can just uh, set it up one, one time basically. I'll call it uh, echidna twap study, or maybe a, even echidna recon default because all of my folders are gonna look like that. And so something I could do is uh, the recipes are ORed with the inputs that you add. And so I'm gonna just show the first version, I guess, called Echidna uh, TWAP study, where it would be the recipe that you only use once. And so I just set up the URLs here. I'm gonna grab the name of the contract, Creek Tester. I'm gonna grab the name of the config and I'm gonna save the recipe. And so now I saved my recipe and this recipe can be used for advanced automation, which we'll show in a moment, but it also can be used uh, in jobs. It's gonna be here, I can just click it, and everything is gonna be out of field, so that way I can just click on run job, and I'm done. However, uh, we created a recipe that is kind of uh, tightly coupled with this specific repo, where in reality, if you use a recon, you're gonna have a lot of repos like this. I bet I'm gonna be able to find one in a few seconds, hopefully without showing a bazillion of uh, secret uh, stuff. But like we got the recon demo free is another example of a repo that will work in the same way. And so the way I will use recon demo free with the recipe is I will just paste the URL and by doing so it will override all of that data because all of the data is ORed where the lower prior goes to the recipe data and the higher prior goes to your inputs. And so something we're gonna be able to do with recipes very soon is we're gonna be able to merge them with webhooks where once you receive a webhook, we're gonna be able to apply the additional data from the webhook while using the recipe as the foundation. So you can set your fuzzer, you can set your default configuration, and then all of the extra stuff that changes is gonna be automatically applied to the same recipe. So that way, a better recipe that uh, will work the same way will be something like default echidna where we wouldn't have a URL and we would instead just have the contract name and the config file name. And so this will be a non-runnable 
uh, recipe because it doesn't, uh, there's no way we can run a job. However, this will be a recipe that will lend itself to webhook automation. And so recipes will unlock this, expect a lot more automation in the future. And uh, um, that's an example of how this type of recipes uh, can be uh, used. And so the first use case that we have for recipes is something we're, we're doing for EBTC for Badger. We have a custom recipe that I've uh, quickly showed earlier, which is a pretty scary recipe because it has a arbitrary command, which is something that uh, you don't have access unless you're the super admin. Uh, but the arbitrary command uh, effectively allows us to set up a mainnet fork, and then it allows to run a forked echidna against the mainnet fork as a means to run periodic checks on live properties on the live EBTC system. And so um, one way we could have done it would have been to just have this and then put like a bot and just have it set that up. But uh, the, the way we actually set it up is we have this recurring job page where we register a recurring job to run every hour. And then we have this page that automatically fills up that will show you the latest run so this is the latest run that happened um, very recently. It happened uh, within an hour from now. And you can see that uh, a bunch of tests were checked, everything passed, and uh, it will also show the coverage report for the things that have been attempted. And so this feature, uh, as we introduce uh, corpus reuse, which means that uh, uh, we can reuse uh, the corpus and the test from uh, bigger runs, will allow to periodically and very frequently check for changes on the live system while at the same time um, perform a lot of tests. And so uh, just for convenience, we also have a link to older jobs as a means to verify that they've happened as, as a means to know uh, whether they're relevant. Uh, as of today, we, we put them this way, but uh, the design is pending. The idea though is that this way, uh, as we effectively unlock automation for fuzzing, uh, uh, the, our last piece of the pie, if you will, is to make sure that we can identify broken properties and we can flag them uh, as soon as possible. And uh, because we're using our job setup, then all of our automation uh, effectively is not, uh, uh, it's just a parallel system on top of it. So you can have sharing, you can have uh, automations, you can have pointers to the recipes. So that's really what we did when it comes to uh, mainnet uh, fuzzing in an automated way. And so as a second aspect that is tied to automated fuzzing, we also found a way to convert the recon starter. So th the same code you're using, we found a way to make it so that if you make your recon starter compatible with Echidna, that forks on mainnet or forks or wherever, we are able to convert it into a, a set of properties that we can check live against the chain. And so this is our latest uh, achievement in uh, property research. And it's the idea that we can take that same code that led your development, we can reuse it to test those same properties against the actual mainnet state. And you can see that as I reload every 12 seconds, maybe we can even go on Etherscan and see that we are basically fetching the latest block. You can see that as I'm on the latest block, I just grab it and we're basically, we're, we're as fast as Etherscan in being updated with our properties and we're comparing the live state with live properties. And so that way we're giving further assurance that those properties are holding up. Obviously, in order for a system to be safe, we would have to extend this continuously. Defending a system is not just uh, checking the same thing over and over. It's also about having different insights. But at the same time, the only thing better than this would be to check properties as they happen in the mempool which is something that I'm definitely interested in exploring. So if you guys wanna team up, we are looking for people to work uh, on something like that. 
but that's where I would uh, shift towards kind of the vision of what we're building and also why we're building it this way. And so the, what we showed today uh, with recipes, recurring jobs and um, monitoring is just the beginning of a bigger effort that is meant to uh, actually prevent exploits on chain. And so uh, this is kind of our initial sketch for how the, uh, this feature should look. Uh, the idea will be that we would have a live tracking of properties here on the, on the left, and that we would have the last uh, job being run. And then uh, over time, we're going to be developing new ways to trigger jobs. And that's because a job may be necessary, as in we need to recheck properties uh, because something has happened to the system or because something will happen to the system that will lead us to uh, a change in configuration or a change in the state. And so the biggest example will be the proposal fuzzer, which is what we are going to be working uh, towards in the future. So the reason why the proposal fuzzer is uh, important to us is what happened in the past. You can see what happened with compound, compound had a bug that caused it to lose $140 million because of most likely a proposal that wasn't fully reviewed. As far as I remember, the proposal caused an upgrade that um, due to having a, a edge case um, for not, che not checking a zero value, then the compound controller would actually overpay via emissions. And so that would be an example of something that can be prevented through the proposal fuzzer, which is the idea that we specify a set of properties such as the compound comp speed. And then what we will do is as the proposal comes in, the proposal has a seven day period. So why don't we take that seven day period for us to test through automated testing, whether we can break the code due to the upgrade. And so we would have a previous st uh, state, we would have the seven days and then we would have the post state and we will then run the properties against that updated state. And over time, we would also look into automatically generating some properties. Uh, but as of today, the technology that we have would allow us very quickly to be able to test proposals uh, by simply simulating them and then running uh, properties that a security researcher identified to be important. So that will be the first example of why this can be very impactful. Another big example of something that I'm willing to bet money is going to happen again. And I'm not just will willing to bet money, I'm literally building something to prevent it, is the cross-chain ownership bug, which is a very straightforward bug for security researchers, but a very weird bug for many people. And so what happened, I think this was uh, the end of 2022, September 2022, uh, Wintermute was about to receive $160 million in uh, Optimism tokens. And for some reason, uh, Wintermute thought that their address, that was a mainnet address, uh, was going to be the same on Optimism. Uh, as developers, we know that every address is aliased on l so mapping of addresses d don't work. And so what ended up happening there is that uh, the Optimism Foundation ended up sending the tokens to a uh, address that didn't exist. And in doing so, another front runner was able to mine um, through mining nonces on the Nose is safe. Uh, they were able to actually obtain access to the uh, address and they were able to steal all of the tokens. So that's another example of a set of operations that um, should be monitored and should have security reviews done to them. And an example uh, of a proposal fuzzing is that where uh, is where proposal fuzzing could be very impactful. And then the last example, this is the most recent one, uh, happened with Gitcoin, where Gitcoin did a proposal, and I remember commenting on this. And effectively, they sent $460,000 of their token to the address zero. And so the only explanation, or maybe they sent it to their own address. You're trying, yeah, they sent it to their own address. And so this is the perfect example of uh, why you need to have a highly engaged security researcher doing anything. 
And but at the same time, this is something that I'm willing to bet again my time, my money, and my attention in, in saying that this is not a mistake that is gonna be. Uh, it's gonna. It's a mistake that is gonna repeat again simply because the majority of people don't really check governance proposals and they don't really check enough time. They don't really spend enough time to making sure that all of those parameters make sense. People really don't read the cold data. And so a simple proposal fuzzer that verifies that the caller has ownership of the uh, wallet would have prevented the optimism exploit. Whereas a simple uh, proposal fuzzer that would have checked that the recipient was going to be a uh, EOA or a rational address would have prevented the Gitcoin ex exploit. And so in uh, summary, about 200 plus million dollars in the last two years have been wasted uh, because nobody bothered to run automated tests. And uh, there's very little argument for, um, for that. It's like, it's really is a, as simple as that. The security space has changed over these two years where there's definitely a bit more freelance security researchers. But from my perspective, all of this stuff should be checked automatically. And so that's what we're moving towards. We're moving towards defining a set of repeatable operations. We're moving towards defining a repeatable set of targets. And most importantly, we're moving towards making sure that if people are not willing to do some sort of check, then at least machines can be leveraged to ensure that those checks are performed uh, promptly and consistently. So that was kind of the tour of our latest features. We showed recipes, which are going to be most likely coming this week to pro. People that have been using Echidna are gonna be really happy about it as like imagine having to type all of these lines every time. Uh, we used to have a button that we are coded for our customers, but now you can basically write your own buttons or talk to us and we'll add it for you. And then for premium customers, uh, in this case for Badger and uh, for other premium customers, we are uh, rolling out recurring jobs as a new uh, frontier to uh, ensure that testing is done consistently and that uh, the second a property is broken, it triggers a war room. And lastly, as a means to move towards a real time set of security uh, reviews, we are experimenting with live monitoring, which is something that I'm super interested in exploring further because it means that the code and the work that you've done in securing your system as a blue team, like as a writer, now becomes uh, useful and can be maintained even when your code is live. And uh, this is an extremely uh, cost-effective way of doing tests because you don't have to write a new version of the test. You can literally just copy paste the solidity. We put it on uh, our uh, monitoring uh, setup and it basically runs on every block. And so that's an example of what is possible for invariant testing. And so uh, what is further possible that I would love to figure out is going to be mempool uh, testing where we will test properties against uh, the mempool as well. Uh, but that's going to require a complete change in architecture. So we are looking for Go developers. If you guys want to collab, feel free to DM me uh, because that's what we want to do. Ideally, we want to be testing at the earliest possible stage, even before the block is finalized. Uh, but as of today, uh, for, for the majority of properties, we are able to test them as the block is finalized, meaning that with the exception of actual exploits, because invariant testing can only test what you set it up to, to check. So if we missed something, that's still a risk. That's why we recommend working with other actors in uh, uh, threat detection as well. But at the same time, when it comes to verifying that the system is behaving as intended and that uh, the, the world wasn't more surprising than the fuzzer, which you should be uh, open to, is the fact that the world is actually the ultimate fuzzer. And so uh, we now have a way to detect this. And anytime this is updated, 
uh, currently there's no delay, but there's already an alert system that the second any of those properties toggle to false, it will immediately trigger a message so that we can immediately respond to said uh, settings. And at the same time, that can be the start for triggering uh, more complex jobs, such as using Echidna, as a means to be able to generate a trace for a possible exploit so that we can quickly debug it. So obviously, uh, a bug bounty remains extremely important. Threat detection through monitoring the mempool, monitoring for new contracts is extremely important. Also monitoring for phishing is another aspect that we're not covering. But at the same time, the invariant tests on chain, on the live system, mean that as your governance changes, as your price feed changes, as your vendors change, the system is going to be able to detect it because it's not, uh, you didn't stop with the security exercise, but you kept doing it as a means to make sure that you're always on top of your game. So hopefully that was an interesting uh, um, view into the future of uh, uh, Recon. Um, that's... Uh, um, where we're, where we're moving towards, if I can tease another couple of ideas um, that we want to add, will simply be the automatically generating the POCs, meaning that once Medusa is done or Echidna is done, and uh, this is started, I'm just refreshing just to see what happens. But as uh, uh, you get logs and you get broken properties, then uh, we will be, we'll, we'll basically will be adding yeah, the code generator immediately. You can preview our code generator at uh, getrecon.xoz slash tools slash medusa and slash echidna. And since we ironed out the majority of the bugs, we'll be rolling it so that any fuzzer that runs will also produce the debugging uh, code uh, automatically. And then the uh, other direction will be mostly around reusable code so that we can perform automated tests and automated attacks against specific categories of code. For example, uh, as I tease, something we'll talk about in the future, we're writing an art, we're currently writing an article about another engagement we did where we wrote a reusable library for year six, seven, five, four, zero, which is asynchronous uh, uh, vaults. So uh, the vault, uh, ER6 is ER6 uh, um, or ERC, uh, uh, what is it, uh, 4626, whereas this one is 7540 and it's basically the asynchronous version of vaults. And so um, we basically wrote this reusable piece of code uh, that allows um, uh, other people to effectively just plug and play their own ER6 7540 vault and test against it. And so as we explore that, uh, we'll definitely be looking to uh, use a few of these tricks, mostly for bug bounties. And then over time, we will be sharing those as well as a means to effectively eradicate certain categories of bugs. So those are basically the two main directions. If you want to look at a quick, this is like, because uh, you stuck around for the office hour till the end, this is like a quick, teaser of something that uh, I open sourced last week is called the catch revert Medusa. This is an example of, um, or basically this is a piece of code that allows to effectively simulate a VM dot snapshot and revert to. That's because you may not have access to that on the Halmos prover. You may not have access to that on Medusa. And so as a means to make sure that you can use VM dot snapshot and VM to revert to for every possible test we wrote or I wrote this and open sourced it for everybody to benefit. And this piece of code allows you to simplify your invariant test because you no longer have to think about the uh, coverage being expanded uh, for the tests that are always undone. And so that's something that we'll talk about in the future as we do an office hours with Centrifuge, which was our previous customer. And uh, at the same time, this is a piece of code. And uh, in the future, we'll also open source the ER67540 uh, tester library. Uh, and those are going to be uh, pieces of contracts that you're gonna be able to reuse for 
any possible target. And so as we um, have hinted at, that's what we also are going to be moving towards, a, a system that allows us to detect what type of contract a specific contract is, for example, a vault or an NFT or a marketplace, and then have some sort of a set of automated properties and automated attacks that we can run as a means to make sure that low hanging fruits are completely eradicated from the chain. So that was a glimpse into the future. If you guys have any quick question, I'm happy to answer it. Otherwise, that was the end of the presentation for this week. And uh, over the next couple of weeks, we should be uh, open sourcing some uh, content uh, uh, done in partnership with Centrifuge. We'll most likely also do a uh, retrospective on the work we've done with EBTC as we moved uh, their code from a theoretical uh, repo to a public repo with public fuzzing. So we'll probably do a full tour of all of the tech uh, at that level. And then uh, on the longer term, expect a bunch more features rolling out, especially when it comes to automating uh, the fuzzer as a means to uh, make it more convenient to use uh, Recon. Thank you for your time. And uh, you guys have an amazing rest of your week. Great talking to you.